Well, each week when I fully turn to the lesson at hand, I shake my head thinking, why on earth did I ever begin this kind of sermon series where I really didn't know what was coming up next? I'm kind of letting the, the doctrine or theology uh, that we might need to look at come up from the text itself. Well, today is reconciliation, which sounds really good, but when you start diving into the history of such a doctrine, there's a lot there. So we'll just kind of skim across the surface, uh, but maybe uh, raise enough questions for you to want to ponder a little longer. But we begin with a question each week, each week because we're looking at these doctrines not as people who are familiar churchgoers who've been sitting in the pew for years and years, but as if we had never stepped foot in a church before. And so in regards to reconciliation, today's question, and please do pardon my language, but I think it's an honest question that might come to us from the streets. Is there anything I can do to piss off God so much that God will give up on me? Can I push God just so far that this lovey dovey God you all talks about, talk about, will get so angry to write me off completely? Now, usually in my experience, someone who is going to ask a question like this is either one of two kinds of people. There are those who are anxious about this question, very genuinely, but they're the kind of persons that are, are so kind and nice and good that they bring to your mind cooing babies and dancing unicorns and rainbow kisses. And you think, of yourself, think to yourself, you have nothing to worry about. Reconcili reconciliation is practically assured. But there's also the other kind of person, and you all know who you are, mm -hmm. who when they hear the question, can I do anything to push God beyond God's limits, begin to think and wonder, what could I do to push God beyond the divine limits? What could I do to make God so mad that the fury and wrath of God would be let loose upon the world. From the knowing smiles, I'm thinking we have more of the latter than the former, but that's just a quick guess. When I was in college in Enid, Oklahoma, I attended the Disciples of Christ Church. They have a very, very nice pastor there. I have to tell you, I don't remember his name, but what I do remember is a plaque that he had on the front of his desk. And any time I went in for counseling or for a visit, I would read that plaque. It's not a scriptural quotation, but it's attributed to God nonetheless. Maybe you've heard of it. The desk plaque read, there is absolutely nothing you can do to make me stop loving you. Nothing. Sign God. Now, I must be somewhere in between the two extremes I mentioned before because sometimes I look at that plaque and feel this enormous wave of, of unconditional love, which is what I think the pastor meant by putting that plaque on there. But sometimes, I'll admit, I would think to myself, just how much could I do to push you, pastor, and God beyond that limit. Today's scripture lesson from the second chapter of the book of Ephesians is the quintessential text on the doctrine of reconciliation. I really didn't know that until I started into my studies. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. I picked the uh, communion hymn today, written by one of my uh, favorite friends, uh, who's also a hymn writer, David Edwards, because it begins with that language, you who were far off have brought home into God's family. Now last week I referenced John Calvin, forgive me, but last week I referenced John Calvin as we looked at the doctrine of election. 
This week, I'm going to refer to another heavy hitter, no less than Carl Barth, whose uh, multi-volume uh, tomes, Church Dogmatics, deals with the topic of reconciliation quite extensively. As a matter of fact, one blogger I read wrote that Carl Barth's doctrine of reconciliation is the crescendo of the symphony that is Church Dogmatics. I haven't read enough of Church Dogmatics to know that this is the crescendo of it, but we'll, we'll take uh, his point. Let me say from the beginning again that I don't pretend to be a scholar on any of these scholars. And like other theologians I've quoted this summer, there's some things that they write that I really like and I really resonate with. There's some things that are like fingers scraping against the chalkboard, and much of it goes right over my head, let's just be honest. And we also have to admit that any time we talk about a theologian, there's what the theologian actually wrote, and then there's all this stuff throughout history that people say about the theologian and their positions. So, I hope I'm not contributing to the misquoting of Carl Barth, but I do have some beef with what he has to say. There's some things that I have come to contrast myself and my theology with the classic theology around reconciliation. Let's, let's get ourselves all on board. In short, reconciliation is a conversation about how God and humanity are related to one another, particularly when we have not been our best selves. Read that when we sin. It also, although this is less the focus of classic theology, but reconciliation is also then about how we relate one to another, especially when we are not our best selves. Barth and so many other theologians ground their understanding of this reconciliation on a, a cornerstone, and that cornerstone is an understanding of the basic essential depravity of humanity. To use the words of a friend of mine in college, we are worms. That's W-O-R-M-S, sorry, that way. We're worms, and God has every right to step on us as much as to nurture us. As much as Bart Tark talks about reconciliation being about God's love and God's grace and God's forgiveness, it's all built on us being worms of this assumption of an original sin that came from the fall of humankind many, many years ago. Well, we have to keep reminding ourselves again and again that the phrase, the fall, and the phrase, original sin, are not biblical phrases. Those are theological thoughts that have been dis uh, discerned and, and written about since then. Now, there is sin, and there's certainly brokenness, and there's certainly a, a, a tear in the relationship between God and us and one another. But it's not quite as it is made out to be. I believe that what happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve ate from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, was that it's not so much that they condemned themselves in that moment to forever be sinful and evil, but what happened in that moment was they grew up. They grew up. It was very quickly, and it was pretty dramatic, but they became essentially mature adults. They, meaning we, chose to see life from the, the vantage point of a divine parent. After all, it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was the tree of the knowledge of God. All that is good and worthy and noble and decent and kind in this world became in an instant as evident as all that was bad and evil and disgraceful and cruel in this world. And, more importantly, all the options in between. 
I've had some good fruit, but I've never had fruit that did that to me. In one bite, that wonderful world of grace and beauty that you had known, that we talk about when we talk about as paradise, suddenly crashed together into the world of doubt and despair and temptation and options. It's like graduating from high school and the world hitting you in the face. As Rabbi Harold Kushner points out in his magnificent book, How Good Do We Have to Be? A New Understanding of Guilt and Forgiveness. The account of Adam and Eve is a mythical description of how the first human beings left the world of animal existence behind and entered the problematic world of being human. Thus, life opened up and they realized that the choices that they had to make are so immensely complicated that they can't possibly, we can't possibly make all of them correctly and rightly. They, we, will inevitably make mistakes. Kushner concludes that Adam and Eve entered a world where well, they will inevitably make mistakes not because they're bad or weak or evil, but just because the choices suddenly are so hard. You know this because this is your life. The choices are difficult to make. It's not always clear what to do. But the satisfactions of having a choice will be equally great. Animals can only be useful and obedient, Christian says, but human beings can be good because we have that choice to be good. So the story of the Garden of Eden is not a story about the fall of mankind, but the emergence of human. Kushner reminds us with a wry grin that the very same human qualities that make sin possible are also the same human qualities that open us up to creativity, beauty, and incredible acts of grace and kindness. The very same options. One of my first critiques of the traditional formula of the doctrine of reconciliation is that it tends to be very individualistic. When you, when you read Bart and so many of the theologians, it's just like they're talking about a one-on-one -on -one wrestling match with God. You know, hey, you, you and me, we're going out this together. You know? It's very individualistic. In classic theology, how I treat my neighbor is important, but it doesn't define my salvation. I think this is flat out wrong. I think how I treat God and how I treat my neighbor are forever intricately bound one to another. Why then would Jesus not define the essence of the law as you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, with all your strength and all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself, not taking a breath between the two. I think that not only will it mean little for me to arrive at the pearly gates having reconciled myself with God, but not my neighbor, I wonder if God will let me even get close at all. Who'd you leave behind now? Go back and take care of them, then come to me. Certainly, Ephesians 2 that we heard Larry read today sets this in the context of, of their day, and that was the conflict between uncircumcised Gentiles and circumcised Jews. The whole conversation is um, that they must be reconciled one to another, and it almost seems like a causal, a cause and effect relationship. Christ has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross. They seem intricately tied together for me. And I can't 
can't go it alone. So that's one problem I have with classic theology and reconciliation. But even more problematic than this hyper-individualization of reconciliation is the sense that reconciliation that we need I have problems with it saying that this brings us back from eternal damnation. So often the doctrine of reconciliation is set in a courtroom. You know the scene because it's described this way all the time. God is the ultimate judge sitting up on the, um, the banister, the banister, wherever, I don't know my language. Ultimate judge whose hands are tied by the law. If it's written in the law, God has no choice. Who condemns humanity to death and eternal punishment for surely the terrible wrongs that we have done. We have done. In this classic atonement theology, Jesus, the one who is perfect and blameless, unexpectedly and quietly slips in the side door and steps into the courtroom and takes on the blame rightly due humanity and then receives the punishment due each and every one of us. I know this is what is passed off as core doctrine in the Christian faith. I've heard it hundreds and hundreds of times and I read it over and over again this last week. And what stunned me as Larry was reading uh, the text today, that it, the language there is, is all about moving beyond the legalistic courtroom language and trying to find a new language. And yet, even out of Ephesians 2, we continue to keep this courtroom language, this judgmental um, atonement theology. Now, I may be putting myself at grave risk saying this, but I think it's wrong, unbiblical, and dangerous. Let me back up my claims here. It's interesting to note that the word atonement, the word atonement, which has become so familiar in Christian theology, is used once in the New Testament in the King James Version of the Bible. The New Revised Standard Version, which I use, adds one more occurrence in the New Testament. So Romans 5.11 and Hebrews 2.17. And in both places, it's referring back to the animal sacrificial culture of the Hebrew Scriptures, which they left a long time ago. We seem to keep it alive, even if we're saying Jesus overcame it. We kind of resurrect it so that we can knock it down again. See what I'm saying? Christianity has tried to disassociate itself from this kind of theology for, for generations. But we do so by keeping it alive. Perhaps if we stuck more closely to the original meaning of the word atonement, at least in its English version, that we'll find what Ephesians 2 was trying to get at. The process of becoming at one with another. Atonement at one. Now, I thought this was just a, a parlor trick and kind of a fun game, but I did a little research uh, and came to find out that actually the English language does mean at one. Um, Shakespeare apparently used it all the time. Atonement as another word for reconciliation. But never in the sense that someone had to come in and die for you and I to be uh, related to one another in a harmonious way, but just that we needed to get our act together and work through it. At one moment, I believe and I understand all of the Bible and history shows us that God wants nothing more than to be at one with us. Having set us free in that garden to be all that we could become and sending us east of Eden. God began immediately on a journey to follow us to and through the heights and the depths and the plains of this world that we would travel. Let me say that again so I'm, I'm focused. God gave us a choice in the garden and said, I've made it easy for you. There's just one thing. You eat this fruit and you're going to look at life just like I do. You're going to grow up. 
So what do we do? We, we want it all. And we eat it. And God says, okay. You have to leave home now because that's what you do when you grow up. So go. But God doesn't then go upstairs and remodel our room into, you know, the new TV room. God puts on the backpack and the hiking boots and follows us. You understand how powerful that is? The Creator desires nothing more than to be reunited with creation. I believe rather than some um, far off magistrate sitting in judgment of humanity from high atop a court bench, court bench, God is rather the restless parent waiting expectantly at the front door, waiting for her son to return, his daughter to return, waiting both for the child who has wandered the world and spent life aimlessly to come back so that a party could be given, but also waiting for the son who stayed home, the sister, the daughter that stayed home, whose heart has wandered far from the grace and love and abundance that the parent has, waiting in the words of that old commercial, with a light on. This reminds me so much of the dark night of my soul. Shortly after graduating from college, I finally came to turn fully with my humanity and all of its beauty and all of its ugliness. That was the night that I called my mother on the phone and told her that not only was I getting divorced, from the woman that I had only married six months previous. I can't tell you how much shame and guilt I had on that. But the reason for the divorce was that I was gay. I held myself through that phone call, and so did my mother, but apparently both of us proceeded to fall apart. I mean, I completely fell apart. In the deep darkness of the middle of the night on the summer eves, the mostly barren campus, I wandered around weeping and wailing uncontrolled. I felt I had hurt all of the friends and family that I loved most and who loved me most, and I had profoundly disappointed not only the people who had taken care of me, but the God who I had professed to love and serve. Somewhere, in the middle of that excruciatingly painful night, I became aware of a presence. Quite a distance behind me, almost beyond my sight, was a person walking at the same pace I was walking, who would stop when I would stop, who clearly was quietly taking in my pain and making sure I would hurt no one else nor myself. She followed me until finally, exhausted and spent from the emotion of my crucible, I wandered back to my apartment, safe, but not sound. But I knew we never spoke of that experience. I knew exactly who it was, and she knew I knew who it was, but we never spoke afterwards of what happened that night. But I knew perhaps better than at any point in my life up to then that God existed in human form and that God wanted nothing more than to be reconciled with me. For me to be reconciled with myself and for me to be reconciled with those around me. There is another faithful and biblical way of interpreting the Garden of Eden. We understand that what happened in this foundational story, that it's not a shame-filled desecration of God, but a coming-of-age story in which we become fully human, then our life's journey is to learn how to make the best possible choices to lead us back as close as we can get to the wholeness and the richness and the fullness that God created in us. Is Jesus necessary in all this? Of course he is. Because for generation after generation, we did not understand this. That a God that came to us in burning bush and pillar of fire, that God came to us uh, in, in a still voice in the cave, and God who came to us in these ancient writings, just 
didn't do the trick. It had to be a God who would in physical form walk behind us. Crying when we cry. Hurting when we hurt. Dancing when we dance. Jesus became God's great desire to help us know that the one who created us knows exactly how difficult this life is. God knows how problematic your day-to-day -day existence is. God understands the temptations that all of us have, not theoretically, but in bodily form. This takes us right back to the doctrine of incarnation that we talked about back in June. Rather than Jesus being kind of a pitiful sacrifice thrown from the rim of a, of a volcano into the fiery wrath of God's hatred, Jesus instead becomes the one who gives us hope, the one who reminds us day in and day out to be our best selves, the protector that follows us behind, the friend that walks beside us, the scout who goes in front. God, then, is the lover who whispers again and again the truth about the abiding love of the Divine One sweetly into our ears. Especially when we feel so unworthy of that love. Especially when we cry uncontrollably in the darkness of the night. Unearned and long lost love is compelling. Jesus is needed, not because we cannot return to God's wholeness by ourselves, but because we won't. We haven't. We don't. Jesus is needed not because we cannot find our way back to God, but because when we get there, our hands are empty and no one is with us. And Jesus is the one that says, go back from the altar and deal with the conflict you have with your neighbor and then bring your offering to me. Is there anything we can do that will piss off God? Hell yes! And we've all done it. Lots of what we do makes God sad and frustrated and angry and perhaps even depressed, which is a sign of all those things. But is there anything we can do that will ultimately separate us from God? No, neither height nor depth nor powers nor principalities nor things to come or things to be will ever separate us from the love of God. God does in fact have a plaque on that divine desk that reads, there is absolutely nothing you can do to ever have me, make me stop loving you. Nothing. But what we forget is that God has come out from behind that desk and has chosen to show us and all those around us that very truth that in no uncertain terms in the birth, in the life, in the ministry, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are reconciled to God and to one another. That is reconciliation. Thanks be to God for it all. Amen.